Thank you very much, Vitas. Thank you very much, Talas, uh, for the warm welcome. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I've been the last time at this school about six years ago. I don't remember exactly. I think it was 2011. And I gave uh, three lectures in a, an autumn seminar on realistic economics. OK, so that's since then, realism has not left this place, I'm sure. Uh, but I haven't been back, so I'm glad to be, be back uh, this time. Uh, the, the topic uh, is uh, uh, cultural consequences of fiat money, cultural consequences of uh, inflation, uh, is a little bit my, uh, is a hobby of mine that I developed some 10 years ago. I, I wrote a book uh, uh, that was commissioned by the Acton Institute. The Acton Institute is a, a research a think tank in the United States uh, that deals with the interrelations between religion and economics. Okay. And so they have a book series and asked me to write a, a book uh, on uh, the interrelations between money and ethics. And so I, I, I wrote a book, and it was meant to be some 50 pages or so, and then I got ca carried away, so I wrote a book of uh, 250 pages. And then they didn't want to publish it. <laughs> so, and I didn't want to cut it, so I, I thought it was, should be like this. Yeah, well, I, I looked for a publisher. Anyway, so this is the reason why they are in this book, there are different uh, chapters, little chapters that comment from a moral point of view, from a Catholic point of view, on different aspects of monetary theory. And there's one big chapter on uh, the uh, cultural and spiritual consequences of uh, fiat money, uh, which was an interesting chapter which I just started thinking about, and there was no literature uh, at the time. So it's still, so 10 years later, there's still not much literature on this. So it's, it's an oddity, right? So you have the oddball in front of you. Uh, if the strange professor is the only guy who seems to be interested in this. And I hope to uh, be able to explain to you today why the topic might merit more consideration. I think it should actually be sociologists should uh, uh, take care of this, and anthropologists should have a look at this, philosophers. But they don't. And uh, the reason why they uh, do not is because usually they don't understand enough of economics. And you have lots of people who are commenting on uh, cultural aspects of capitalism. Right, of the, the real world economic uh, systems that we have had in the past 200 years. And usually this kind of cultural analysis is very descriptive. Right? And it's a juxtaposition of elements that are verifiable in uh, observed reality, but of which the authors usually do not understand uh, the causes. Right? And here, economists can contribute something because that's our main business. Right? We are mostly interested in the mechanisms, how things relate. And we are not particularly good at cultural anthropology and stuff like this. This is not really our field, and morals and so on is not really our field. But if there's one thing that we are good at and we are interested in is in studying mechanisms. And so what I will try to explain to you today is how uh, certain monetary mechanisms create certain results certain patterns in culture uh, that we are all familiar with. So let's start with a few uh, definitions. So, so culture, make a very short definition. Culture, for, I would def define as the way we do things. Okay. We can eat in various ways. We, we can eat with a fork and knife, with chopsticks, with, with the hands, and so on. You see this in different parts of the world. Right? You cannot say this is the right way to do it, this is the wrong way to do it. Uh, but there are different ways of doing this. Uh, some people sleep on, the, uh, on mattresses. Some people sleep on futons. Other people sleep on uh, straw uh, and so on. It's difficult to say which is the right way to do it, but there are different ways of doing this. In Germany and in the US in particular, very often families don't gather together for meals. Everybody's helping himself out of the fridge. Right? So if there is a family meal, it's a big event. It's the weekly <laughs> event in an American family. You probably cannot imagine this, because culturally, uh, this is uh, still a, a, well, a traditional country, I think. But uh, in the US, that's how it is. Right? So is this right or wrong? That's not my business to explain to you whether it's right or wrong. But I just state there, there are differences. There are different ways how we do these things. Now, uh, the way how we do things, of course, do not, does not happen in a vacuum. It's uh, influenced, or now in scientific terms, it's determined by. Right, various uh, circumstances, by the environment in particular. It's uh, uh, determined by uh, climatic conditions, right? Eskimos uh, sleep, eat, uh, uh, move in different ways than people living in the Congo, right? Because well, already the temperatures are very different. 
Uh, people living close to uh, geographical conditions come into play. People living close to the sea have different habits than people living in the mountains. Right? And of course, the economy is also one of those environments that shape the way we do things. Right? Well, my subject is uh, uh, an inflationary environment, an economy characterized by the use of uh, fiat money. <clears throat> and I will explain how this relates to, uh, in, uh, to inflation. Right? So, the question is, how do our monetary institutions that are fundamental for our economy and have been fundamental for the past 200 years, and in particular for the past 50 years or 70 years, how do they shape the way we do things? How do they shape our culture? That's my subject. Okay. So what I'll do uh, in my uh, talk is uh, I will proceed in three steps. I'll first talk a little bit about the nature and causes of uh, inflation, okay? I'll talk about some of the mechanisms. And then I'll uh, explain how these mechanisms come to pl play out in the nucleus of um, uh, our, our current monetary system, which is uh, banks, or how they shape the behavior of bankers. And this is verifiable as from the 19th century, so it is rather old. And in the third step, in the last step, I'll talk about how uh, these monetary institutions have shaped uh, the uh, behavior of non-financial sector persons and institutions in the past 70 years. Okay. So let's start off with the definition of uh, inflation. Inflation has, uh, today is uh, uh, defined as a, uh, a permanent or more or less permanent increase of the price level. Right? So this is what all the students have learned or should have learned anyway. There's a more uh, ancient uh, definition of inflation which says that uh, inflation is an artificial increase of the money supply. And the two definitions are related. Uh, it's an artificial increase of the money supply. What does this mean, an artificial increase of the money supply? Well, the people who have coined this um, uh, definition of inflation, which, by the way, uh, relates to the etymological roots of the word. Right? To inflate means to blow up. Uh, it's the Latin word inflare. That in a verb, inflare. Right? So what the people who have coined this inflation in the 19th century had in mind is the process of ex nihilo money creation. The process that, of course, is the only process that we know today. It's the only one that we are really familiar with because for us it's kind of normal that money is being created by commercial banks. So this is inside money, right? What the economists call inside money. And it's also created by central banks and it's outside money. But it's created in both cases. It comes not out of uh, any, any transformation of uh, material that we find in the physical world as something that we create. And typically, the physical support that we choose is something that is either non-existent, as in the case of scriptural money, right, accounting money, or uh, ha is very cheap. Right? It can be produced at will, as in the case of banknotes or in the case of uh, token coins. So... Uh, Right, so this is the idea where we have inflation is an ex nihilo creation of money. Whereas the regular way of producing money is the one that consists in transforming uh, commodities that are suitable to be used as media of exchange, such as gold and such as silver. Right? We, we are getting them out of the ground and we are transforming them into coins. Right? So that would not be inflation. It's just money production. Whereas inflation is the artificial creation of money. Uh, through uh, banks uh, in particular. Now, uh, what are the causes of uh, uh, inflation? Uh, now we can't, I won't spend too much time on this, but I would just like, uh, to, uh, like to stress um, uh, a few basic mechanisms. If we look at inflation now in the, sense of, in the conventional sense today, inflation is an increase of the price level, a permanent increase of the price level. What are the causes that make that the price level grows and the causes that make that the price level diminishes? A price is an exchange relationship right, between money on the one hand and then some other good on the other hand. And to make a long story short, then the, the price, the exchange ratio, is essentially determined by the relative scarcities, right, by the marginal scarcities of the goods that are being exchanged. Right? If money becomes more scarce relative to non-monetary goods, then the price level will diminish right? because you will give 
smaller and smaller quantities of money in exchange for those other goods. Right? Money becomes more scarce. Right? You give less of this in exchange for the other goods. And on the other hand, if, the, uh, if money becomes less scarce as compared to the other goods, right? so if, for example, if the money, uh, the quantity of money grows faster than the quantity of uh, the other goods collectively, well, then the uh, price level will tend to increase because right, uh, each money unit becomes relatively less scarce as compared to the other goods. Okay. This is a um, basic, uh, a simple way of to reason about changes in the price level. Now, uh, we need to stress the following point. If you have a growing economy, then the natural tendency in a growing economy would be for the price level to diminish. And the simple reason is that the very nature of economic growth is that you increase the quantities of all non-monetary goods. That was it, what, that's what it means to have economic growth. So if the money supply does not change, or does not change as much as the quantities of all the other things that we produce, well, then the natural tendency is that money becomes more scarce relative to the other goods, so the price level will diminish. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is indeed, it's not just a theory, this is in my head, it's something that <laughs> you can look up in the statistics of virtually all European countries and of the US uh, up to World War II the large tendency that you observe wherever you had significant economic growth is for the price level to diminish. In Britain, the price level diminished throughout the 19th century. In the US, it by and large diminished throughout uh, the 19th century with uh, two interruptions. The first one was the war of 1812 and 1814. It was a war between the US and, and uh, Britain. Britain won, by the way. Right? So they had their troops in, in Washington, D.C., but they, they went back. They didn't want to occupy the country. Right? And the other one was the War of Secession, right? what the Americans call the, the Civil War uh, in the 1860s. During a war, what the government usually does is to stimulate the production of money because it wants to pay soldiers and war equipment out of money tickets produced ex nihilo, right? out of nothing. So as a consequence, in war times, right, money becomes less scarce to all other goods, so the price level tends to increase and tends to increase quite substantially. As soon as the hostility ceased, right, each time, right, the money production, the artificial money production was interrupted, and as a consequence, the deflationary forces coming from growth, right, from industrial production, tended to push the price level down. And this you see in US statistics very clearly until World War II. I'll talk about World War II in a second. And in the case of Britain, it's the same thing. Right? There are two interruptions. You have the Napoleonic Wars at the beginning of the 19th century, and then you have World War I one century later. These were the only times when the pricing level increases. And each time, as soon as the hostility ceases, prices start to diminish right? because you have economic growth, and economic growth pushes prices down. Now, we don't have time to make a class about uh, kind of macroeconomics, right? It's of course, if you come from a purely Keynesian point of view, if Keynesian economics is all that you know, this is a miracle, right? How can an economy grow <laughs> if the price level diminishes? Now, I, I don't have the time to, to do this, but you can ask Vitas. Uh, he, he might give you the, uh, the explanation. So it's an important thing. So <clears throat> things started only to change as from World War II. As from World War II, we had a price level increase, a permanent price level increase, all over the Western world. And today, you also have a permanent price level increase in Lithuania and other uh, countries that were formerly part of the Soviet empire. Right? So in the Soviet communist totalitarian setting, right? of course, prices are not market prices. They are just uh, ordained by uh, uh, bureaucratic uh, uh, deliberations, and uh, well, so I mean, uh, so you don't have movements of the price level. Prices are set just by bureaucrats. That's all. And so, in a, but in the market economies, we had a permanent increase of the price level. How is this possible? As from World War II, central banks started uh, producing intentionally 
so much money that the price level would never diminish but would always increase. And the reason for this change is, uh, has nothing to do with uh, the uh, requirements of economic development and so on. It's just that uh, under the influence of uh, John Maynard Keynes but also of other economists writing in the first half of the uh, 20th century, uh, political decision makers had different ideas of what the best economic policy would be and the best monetary policy would be. So they intervened in such a way, so they pushed for an increase of the money supply in such a way that the price level would always increase. Okay. So um, uh, Milton Friedman once said, an uh, American uh, economist who died a few, 10 years ago, uh, he once said that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Uh, so what he meant that if the price level increases under normal circumstances, it's always because you have an increase of the money supply, and also or you might have a, a reduction of the demand for money, but say you always have an increase of the money supply. I should just add the following compliment. Pri permanent price inflation is always and everywhere a consequence of monetary interventionism. Right? It does not happen spontaneously. It's always something that is intentionally brought about. It doesn't happen just by chance. It doesn't fall from the skies. We can discuss whether this is suitable, whether this is good. So there are disagreements all about this question. But right, one thing is sure, it is not something that is inbuilt in a laissez-faire setting. It's not something that uh, emerges spontaneously out of a market economy. It's always something that happens as a consequence of political arrangements that are made such that the money supply increases at a rhythm sufficiently high so as to overcompensate the deflationary pressure, the price deflationary pressure, coming from economic growth. Okay. Now, an, another uh, little point uh, concerning the uh, production of money. Um, you can have an ex nihilo creation of money in different ways. The one that we are only, need only to be uh, concerned about is uh, the one that goes via a uh, 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 creation of credit. Right? In our monetary system, the monetary system that have, has dominated the West in the past 200 years, ex nihilo creation of money was always an ex nihilo creation of money by banks. And even banks, right? Banks, uh, they can uh, create accounting money, but it's not. It's not necessarily so that they have to create it by creating a credit. Right? The banker could create an account for himself, technically. I mean, technically speaking, he could create an account for himself and just write a number on that account. In that case, he would have created money without giving a credit to himself. He just goes on and spends the money. That's actually how some bankers did it at the, in the early years of banking, right? end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. Okay. Today, and for reasons that do not concern us, uh, almost 100 percent, there are some exceptions, almost 100 percent of all money units that are created, they are created in the context of a creation of credit. Uh, so the bank creates a credit by creating money, or creates money by creating a credit. And the, way the, the, the one technique that is familiar to all of us is uh, a real estate credit. Right? So once you guys, or the younger persons here, uh, get a diploma, it probably uh, you get a job, and one of the first things you will try to do is to buy a nice uh, studio, or a nice apartment, or I don't know what, or some real estate, or you want to set up a firm. So you go to the bank. Right? What you do at the bank, so the banker well, so asks you a few questions. What is your revenue? You say, oh, you come with a diploma from ISM. Wow, this is, this is great. So you will have a lot of revenue. It's wonderful. Uh, and you have all this professional network. You will have a great career. OK, so you get a lot of money from the banker. And so you sign the contract. And by signing the contract, in fact, what you do is to create two things. You create uh, a financial title. Okay. You create a, a credit product by signing. The document is the IOU, right? It's, the, uh, it's, it's a debt instrument that the banker now can use to sell to, to other people and so on. It's the first thing that you create. And the second thing that you create is the amount of money on your bank account. The banker doesn't have the money, as a rule. Right? You create the money by signing a credit. There's a promise of a future payment. So he credits this amount on your bank account. Right? 
Vitas was kind enough to send me the aggregate balance sheet of uh, Lithuanian monetary and financial institutions, private, right, not, not central bank. So it's clear that uh, uh, Lithuanian commercial banks uh, and similar institutions are uh, financed to 60% by deposits. And who's creating the deposits? It's not people depositing money in the bank, it's people taking out credits, so the bank is crediting the, on its liability side right, the, the accounts of the customer. It's the customer that creates both the credit and the money that he can then use to buy his apartment. Okay? So this is important, as is with the credit creation mechanism. Now, <clears throat> what are the cultural consequences that result from it. Let's first look at the particular circumstances of the banker. And then let's look at the consequences for the other sectors of the economy once we have um, a permanent increase of the price level. Right? You've already learned now, right? we had this permanent increase of the price level only as from World War II. Uh, something that is familiar to all of us and we think it's kind of normal as this is how the world is in always has been and never will be, will be different, actually is something that is quite recent. Right? We are living for the first time ever in an age of price inflation. The age of price inflation starts only in 1945. Okay. So it's something more recent. It's something very special. So we'll talk about this in a, in a third step. Now, the, the next step is to discuss what's the particular situation of the banker who creates money, right? Commercial bankers create money already in the 19th century and they create money up to, the, up to World War II, so even before we have a permanent inflation of the, the price level, permanent increase of the price level. Right? So if we have stable prices or decreasing prices, we still have inflation in the, the old sense, right? Ex nihilo creation of money. What are the cultural consequences of an ex nihilo creation of money, and we can study this in the case of the banker because it's he who creates this money. Okay, so why does the uh, banker do this? That's the first question we should ask, and the, the, uh, the, the answer is, of course, well, he derives revenue from this. Uh, that's why he creates money. You sign the contract, and you sign a contract that says, well, I'll pay you back the sum that you credit now on my account, plus I will pay interest on this. And that's where the banker earns his money. So what he is doing there is, uh, in financial parlance, he's leveraging his own money. Right? He has so and so much capital that he brought into the bank. And of course, he can lend out the capital, but usually he does not lend out the capital. He lends out money that people create themselves by signing credit contracts. So he's leveraging the return on his own money. Okay. Now, the interesting thing here is that uh, the, uh, this uh, source of revenue is, in principle, unlimited. And we have here a big difference as compared to a situation in which no money creation and credit creation takes place. Let's imagine in a, situ a system, let's say we outlaw uh, the creation, ex nihilo creation of money. And there have been instances in the past where they had been outlawed, there's still a uh, po policy debate going on whether we should outlaw it or not. Right? So a few, uh, two um, IMF economists, Benesch, and was the other guy, uh, was a German guy, was the co-author. So they, they have been revisiting the debate on 100% reserves. Right? This is an old economic debate that dates back to uh, the Spanish uh, 17th century and so on, and then was debated between the currency school and the banking school in the 19th century and was debated by the Chicago school in the 1930s. And today there are always people around. Right? The French Nobel Prize winner in economics, uh, Maurice Allais, right? he was a, uh, an advocate of 100% reserves. 100% reserves means that a commercial bank cannot create money out of nothing. Right? It cannot just create money, so it cannot create credits out of nothing. Right? The only sums that it can lend out are the sums that somebody else has entrusted to the bank. Now, if you have such a situation, then it's clear that you get in necessarily some sort of a, an equilibrium, some sort of a situation point. Right? If people are demanding more credits, right, well, uh, increased demand means that the price will be higher, so interest rates will, will increase. Right? Uh, if people are saving more, right, the supply will increase, so the interest rates will diminish, and at some point you get a saturation. Nobody has an incentive anymore to, to supply uh, uh, more savings to the market. Right? You get a saturation somewhere in the system. But if 
credits come ex nihilo. They're created not out of savings, but by a simple stroke of the pen. This saturation does not exist. There are still some limitations in place, and I'll come to talk about them uh, in a minute, right? Oh, I might say right away, right? Of course, if the banker does this, he becomes more fragile, right? His risk, uh, counterparty risk increases, his liquidity risk increases, and so on. Right? So there are some limitations. We would not go beyond this. Right? But in principle, as far as the, the, the pure quantities are concerned, there are no limitations, precisely because it comes out of nothing. Savings are always limited because they curtail our current consumption. So the amount of savings are always limited somewhere. Creation of money is not limited right, because it's just the stroke of the pen. Right. So as a consequence, then, we have a, a phenomenon that cultural critics in the 19th century noticed very well, namely there is some sort of uh, uh, insatiability right, in, in finance. Bankers, in particular, they never have enough. And they always want more, always want more business and, and so on, uh, because there's no natural stopping point, no natural saturation point. First observation. Second and related observation, because the banker, by uh, creating more credit, more money, becomes more fragile. This has important uh, repercussions on his behavior. He needs to be much more calculating, much more circumspect. Much more, uh, much more foresight than other market participants. Uh, he needs to be rational in a very particular way, much more rational than the others. If you're just operating with your own money, well, you're not indebted to anybody. Well, you can operate more or less fine, but you just, just have your customers, you have your suppliers and your employees, and as long as you get along with them, uh, there's no need to have the, the latest techniques of uh, management and so on. Right? But a banker needs to be very precise in his calculus. And that's what they have been doing, right? They, they imported the last up-to-date management techniques in order to manage risk. It's the same thing today, right? Manage, uh, bankers at the forefront of the new quantitative techniques of risk management and so on. Right. On the other hand, uh, right, so there is, from a microeconomic point of view, a, a, a very strong emphasis on rationality, shrewdness, circumspection, and so on. On the other hand, as far as the industry as a whole is concerned, the industry as a whole becomes a rationality trap, what economists call a rationality trap. That is, people start behaving in a way that is rational from an individual point of view, but absurd from an, a macroeconomic or overall point of view. If more and more in, uh, resources are invested in, in banking, well, uh, it might be worthwhile for the banker, but for the economy as a whole, that, that's a negative because the human resources that now go to banking are lacking elsewhere in the economic system. Right? And because there's no stopping point, more and more resources go into banking, into finance, and more and more resources, especially intellectual resources, are withdrawn from the rest of the economy. So it's perfectly rational from the point of view of the banker. It's irrational from the point of view of the system as a whole. To give you one ex other example, also related to government interventionism, if governments propose free education, especially free higher education, then from an individual point of view, it's rational to try to get a diploma from a distinguished university or to study as long as possible. Because the longer you study, the better is the diploma that you get, well, the better are your opportunities on the job market. Okay? So it's rational from an individual point of view, but it can be completely irrational from an overall point of view. Right? If everybody wants to be whatever, uh, a risk manager or a, a cultural anthropologist and so on, you have no more bakers and gardeners and so on. Now, this is a disequilibrium from the overall point of view, of an excess of intellectual production uh, and a shortage of the other professions. And in that case, as a consequence of ex nihilo creation of money, you have the same tendency. Right? It's very interesting because you have this strange combination, very shrewd, very great shrewdness as far as the microeconomic uh, orientation is concerned, one's own business is concerned, and a complete disconnect as far as the larger equilibrium is concerned. It's a disconnect because very often the same people notice this. Right? You probably have asked yourself the question, is this rational? If everybody rushes to the university gets an education, of course I should do it, right? but isn't this absurd? Of course it's absurd, right, from an overall point of view. It's the same thing also in the, in the case of banking and finance. Right? 
there is an optimum amount of resources uh, that go to uh, any industry, but this optimum amount can only be determined once you have uh, true competition. But bankers escape to this true competition, they escape to the limitations that come from the free market because they can create money out of nothing. A further point is, again, related to this. Bankers, we have said, are fragile. Right? They're in a lot of debt. So as a consequence, they need to interact with their environment in such a way as to mitigate those risks. So first of all, one, one thing that they do is bankers tend to be very social, very political animals. They're in touch with everybody. And they're also in touch with politics a lot because they're very precise demands that they uh, address to, to policy. They want especially that, well, uh, ideally, that um, uh, society as a whole right, bails them out, that is, uh, takes on the risk that they have been taking on personally. Right? Something that is very clear today, right? Banks go bankrupt, so there's immediately the call, the central bank should uh, bail them out. So what does the central bank do? Well, the central bank hands out more money. But, but if it creates more money, then of course it reduces the relative scarcity of each euro. Right? So who is paying? Well, it's all users of money. It's all of us. It's just a tiny bit, so it's not much. Right? We don't feel it. But still we're paying. Right? So it's a socialization of the risk. Uh, or the government comes into play and hands over subsidies to the banks. Same thing, same principle. Banks did this already 200 years ago, and probably longer. So asking the government, well, you should help us. And one way you can help us is to by set up, uh, setting up central banks, right? central institutions right? that centralize the gold reserves, because at the time money, the monetary system was based on gold and on silver. So we're centralizing our reserves uh, so as to be able to help out each of us when we have a li liquidity constraint. So that's what they did. Right? Uh, central banks do not, as a rule, right, spring out of the market. In the history of banks, there were exactly one private, or so two private central banks, both of them in the United States in the 1850s. Right? The first one uh, was called the Suffolk Bank, S-U-F-F-O-L-K. So for those of you who want to do some readings on this, right? and the Suffolk Bank was driven out of the market by another central bank, which was the Bank for Mutual Redemption. And guess how the Bank for Mutual Redemption drove the Suffolk Bank out of the market? Well, by being less stringent on all the commercial banks with which it cooperated. So the Suffolk Bank asked them to be relatively virtuous. And the other banks said, well, we don't have to be that virtuous. You can have lower reserves and so on. You can make more risky investments. And they were driving the other guys out of the market. So a private central bank does not work because in competition, it's very dri quickly driven out of the, the market in a downhill competition, right? So the government is central for commercial bankers because it can pre provide these, the, the essential service of socializing the risks. Uh, it's sort of say a key factor of success. It's a factor of production for a commercial bank. Somebody else needs to take on some of the risk. And that's what they did. Okay. Now, it goes further than this. Now it becomes really interesting because we're coming to political culture. Uh, if, central, if commercial banks are confronted with monarchical regimes, with families, they typically have a long-run perspective because they want to bequeath one day, right, the prince or the, the king, right, one day he wants to hand over all of his kingdom to his heir. So he has a long-run perspective of how to handle things. And he doesn't want to run down the country because he wants to hand over wealth. So if commercial banks arrive then in such a context and they're expressing those demands, uh, the probability is high that they will not be heard. Right? Because it's a short-run benefit for the bank, but it's a long-run uh, negative for the country. So therefore, commercial banks have from the outset, and this is not just a, a theoretical thing, they have been very strongly involved in the establishment of republican political regimes and democratic regimes in particular. Okay. Because they want, do not want to do business with uh, another entity with a counterparty that has a permanent interest in this in a long run perspective, they want to have other people on the other side, decision makers, that just have a temporary inter interest such as themselves. That is the reason why Wall Street bankers finance both the Bolshevik Re Revolution uh, and the Nazis. Okay, Think about this. 
and don't believe me, read uh, Anthony Sutton. Right? So he's an uh, English uh, historian. You can even download his books. I mean, uh, at least one of those books is on the internet, right? Anthony Sutton. Right? So um, bankers, in, uh, in short, right, they, they are users of money. They are not owners of money. And this colors right, their outlook and the way they're doing business. They have a higher time preference than the others. They want to exploit resources and not grow the resources, not pre preserve them. And this is how they uh, uh, influence their environment as well. OK, so this is how things are going in a situation in which we have inflation in the old sense. Right? So we have uh, the creation of ex nihilo creation of money. Right? Now, the last step uh, of my talk, the thing that I wish to address are the particular consequences that result from a situation in which you have a permanent increase of the price level. Right? So the creation of money is pushed to such a level and permanently to such a level that not only the money supply increases, but that also the price is increased. And this is the situation, as I've said, that we had since World War II. Now, in such a, a situation, what we observe is the following, namely that the same incentives that without price inflation only concern the bankers come to influence the behavior of all other sectors. And the basic mechanism is the same. All other sectors now, too, can enrich themselves by going into more debt. And then all other sectors can enrich themselves by leveraging their spending. Why is this so? Uh, uh, let's go back to the example that I've uh, already given. You go to the bank um, and take out a credit to buy real estate, you, to buy your apartment. Why do you do this? I mean, probably you've never given a thought about this, and I always invite my students to think about this. Why do we do this today? It's a matter of cost. And 100 years ago, uh, ago our ancestors did not do it. In the 19th century, nobody was even thinking about doing this. The way you did it in the past is you accumulate cash. And once you have your little stack of cash, you go and buy the house. You first save and then buy the house. Today, we buy the house with the credit, then we pay back. Why do we do this? Is this just more advanced, uh, sophisticated, and, and so on? No, the reason is that the economics are different. If you are living under a system where the price level increases every single damn year, right? then as a consequence of this increase of the, the price level, all revenues will increase because prices are finally unit revenues for, for sellers. Right? So you will join the job market, let's say, next year. In two years, you will earn, I don't know what, uh, 20,000 or 30,000 euros. Now we have price inflation. It means that in 20 years, your revenue will be twice as high, even if you remain as stupid <laughs> as on the day of your graduation. Okay. Of course, we will not, right? Because you accumulate professional experience, you become even better, right? So your revenue will increase, which means that if you go into debt at a fixed interest rate, right, you're paying whatever, uh, 500 euros debt service every month, that stays, but your revenue increases year after year. At the beginning, it's a heavy charge. Eventually, it's a light charge. See, see my point? If we don't have an increasing price level, the mechanism doesn't work. If the price level stays the same or diminishes, it's actually uh, very dangerous to do this. You should not take out a credit because you risk hurting yourself. Your revenue might not increase or not increase much. Right? So you're always burdened with the debt service. So it's better that you first accumulate and then buy. It's different today. And for the same reason that for a household, even for a household, it's worth the while to go into debt in order to finance our investments. Of course, it's also worthwhile for firms. Right? Firms go into debt to finance their investments. Governments do this, of course, all the time. Right? But they do this particularly in our day because they know that future tax revenue will be higher than today simply by the mechanics of price inflation. So they can go into debt now at a fixed interest rate. Oh, today, yes. Negative interest rates. Okay, forget about this. Right? But even if you have positive interest rates, uh, well, you you have a strong incentive to do so. Okay. So this uh, is part of an overall phenomenon well known by sociologists, which is called the financialization of the economy. Right? Non-financial sector 
entities start behaving like financial sector ent entities. And they're doing this by taking out more credit, and they're doing this also by investing in a certain way, right? You're investing more in financial titles uh, rather than in, in, in industrial business and so on, uh, and for various reasons that I do not need to discuss now, right? We have this phenomenon of financialization. But of course, with uh, financialization come the uh, uh, cultural features that I already mentioned in the case of banks, right? We become more fragile. We become more interdependent uh, with others, right? We become automatically more politicized. We become more interested in preventing that other people uh, do something completely wrong, right? If you have a very highly indebted economy and somebody goes uh, bankrupt, it will have negative repercussions on all others. If there's no debt or few debt in the economy, well, I mean, a bankrupt firm also creates negative externalities for its immediate business partners, but then that's it. But in our system, that's not how it is. If a major French bank goes bankrupt, let's say it will not happen, right? But let's say it did, you would feel it until Lithuania. So you automatically become more right, uh, politicized in your approach, and your incentives grow to exercise influence on the government so that it might uh, uh, intervene, regulate the economy to prevent such abuses. We have the same phenomenon of insatiability that I mentioned in the case of bankers. The richer you are in our current system, the easier it is for you to obtain additional credits. If you're young, you're poor, uh, you can buy a, a house and the house is then, or the apartment is the collateral, so the bank will lend you on this. But that's almost all you can do. If you're rich, you have already a lot of collateral, a lot of things that you own. Right? You can pledge this as a collateral to get out additional uh, uh, credits. And then banker, just, bankers do something that they call uh, rehypothecation. I won't explain what this is, but the students can look it up, right? Rehypothecation, which is the repledging of the same collateral again and again <laughs> in different uh, uh, credit contracts. Right? So the point is, if you have permanent price inflation, right, the, the whole uh, credit mechanism has no natural stopping point. The only stopping point that remains are the additional risks that are being taken. But if the risks are socialized by the central bank, then we get a rationality trap. Right? We are behaving in a way we are taking out more credit, so it's good for us, good for our bottom line, and the risks are socialized. But from the system as a whole, it's a very dangerous thing because the system as a whole absorbs too much risk, so there's too much waste of resources. Right? It's a classical rationality trap. It's very evident today. Okay. So right, the same uh, phenomena that in the 19th century only concerned commercial bankers become more widespread, become more generalized. Um, just a few other consequences that follow from it. Um, Uh, maybe one or two. Um, uh, one typical phenomenon <clears throat> as well known is, is uh, in capitalism, as we, we call it the speed. We cannot call it speed would be positive, right? We might call it haste. It's a little bit more pejorative, right? So people hurry up, right? So they they are not relaxed. They don't take long vacation. They don't take time to think over things and so on. They hurry up to get things done, especially in investment. Financial markets are very fast. Uh, but even uh, uh, economic life is, is very fast. People always hurry. They're always running around uh, uh, behind uh, schedule and, uh, and so on. So where does this come from? Well, it's something that reflects um, uh, the fact that in a system in which you have constant increase of the, money, uh, of, of the price level, the sooner you enter the system, the better it is. Right? Because if you buy a house or you buy an apartment, uh, at an early point of time, then you benefit from the increases uh, of the, the value of this apartment in the course of time. So it's, it's cheaper to buy it early rather than later. And this concerns all fixed capital investments. So you always run right, to, to do things as fast as possible. And of course, it's, we have here the root of this, but it colors all the, the other uh, social interactions. Another uh, uh, typical cultural uh, consequence is the indifference uh, that we often have toward uh, the things that we own. Right? In, a, 
in a, uh, um, so in our system, so we, we, we buy things not for ourselves, but as a way of investing in a way of holding wealth. So the way you want to hold wealth, if you have a lot of debt, is to hold wealth in a, in a liquid form. So for example, if you own a, a house, the house uh, ideally is well located and it can be easily sold to, to other people. So the point is that in this case, the house must be as pleasing as possible to other persons, not to yourself. Uh, so we become indifferent to the aesthetics. We're looking around just at standards that are conventional, that everybody agrees on. Right? We know applying our own taste, and we don't try to develop our own taste, right? So the refinement of individual appreciation and individual creation that we could observe in the 19th century and look at 19th century buildings here in town is very different from our behavior today. We are heavily in debt, therefore we are much concerned about liquidity, so therefore we are building places in such ways, not that they please to us or that they develop a new aesthetic standard, but that they please to the common taste that is already established. Okay. Now, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. There are a few other, few other things that I could say, but you get the, the gist, right? So there are actually a lot of things that uh, economists can say about the cultural repercussions of, uh, of fiat money and of uh, permanent price inflation that only can exist in a fiat money system. In conclusion, all right, I would uh, uh, like to stress the following, namely that many of the uh, cultural uh, features of uh, what we call capitalism and what especially you have, in the, uh, you have a whole lot of uh, critical literature coming from sociologists, uh, anthropologists and so on. So it's critical. Capitalism is, is a dysfunctional system. It's a, a system that has very negative uh, consequences. Yes, but most of this stuff, I wouldn't vouch for it every single case because I haven't examined uh, every single case, but at least the major parts of it are not the consequence of a free market economy but are the consequences of monetary interventionism. Right? Why, and this brings me to the final uh, question, so why did we have this system if it brings about these uh, uh, quite deplorable co cultural consequences? Why did we put the system into place? Why do we have uh, credit and money creation ex nihilo? Why do we create uh, central banks to salvage commercial banks? Why did we create fiat money rather than commodity money and so on? And the answer is, again, it's, uh, uh, it's not a big grand plan, right? There are always conspiracy theories and say, yes, it's always been planned by the Freemasons in the 18th century, it went from there. Okay, maybe some people made such plans, I mean, people make a lot of plans, right? So you don't know. I think it was a step-by-step -step movement, right? a tâtonnement, as uh, Valras said this, right? You're, you're moving step-by-step -step towards such a situation, and each individual decision is motivated by an immediate concern. And the immediate concern always revolved around government finance. Right? Why did commercial banks were not important before the 17th century? Why did they become important as from then? Well, essentially because governments started creating them and started subsidizing them and started bailing them out. Right? Because governments wanted to uh, obtain additional sources of financing. The most famous case is the one of the Bank of England. Right? It was created with the mission of providing 1.2 million pound credit to the crown. That was the mission. Therefore, the, the bank was created. And then, as soon as you have banks of the sort that create money and create credit, but which are fragile, well, you uh, confront the problem that from time to time they go bankrupt. And then your sources of financing dry up. So as a government, you have an incentive to make a deal with the banker to sell, uh, save him uh, in the short run by putting into place new institutions that uh, guarantee uh, the, the perennity of, of the bank, even if the more longer run consequences are even more negative. Right. So that's the situation with, that we have today. Right? We've uh, arrived uh, in a, a very particular uh, situation with very particular um, uh, cultural features uh, as a consequence of a long series of government interventions, each of which was motivated by immediate concerns, but which eventually brought about a culture of inflation right, that we never had before, before World War II. And it's important to keep both the economic mechanisms in mind and also the historical perspective, right, because that's important from a political point of view. Uh, few people are really happy with this, even Keynesians. Right, 
Even a Keynesian economist, of course, Keynesian economists think it's good to have expansionary monetary policy. It's a good thing for the economy as a whole. But if you consider all side effects, you might come up with a, a different policy conclusion overall. Right? It's like a, a, a doctor, you know, some might say, yeah, this medicine that helps you to uh, uh, get rid of your uh, rheumatism or something like this, but uh, it, it might get you cancer in the longer run. So even if you're convinced there are some positive aspects, if finally, well, you, you, you would not recommend that, that remedy uh, in the longer run. Yeah, in any case, from an Austrian point of view, Austrians think that there's no need for monetary intervention. Right? It's just uh, an expediency for governments to get additional revenue that they do not dare to ask the citizens in the form of taxation. Right? So from an Austrian point of view, there's no justification for this at all. It's just uh, uh, a big, big blown up rationality trap <laughs> that we have created out of short run policies. And we are and have been for the past 70 years, we have been in the long run, right? the long run consequences of these policies. 